Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Sinato with Real Progressives. Uh, today we have a special guest with us. Uh, Mindy Messmer is running for Congress in New Hampshire. Uh, she's a state representative there, uh, and she's also uh, an environmental scientist. So, Mindy, thanks for joining with us this afternoon. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. No problem. Um, well, can you start off by telling us a little bit about what inspired your run for Congress and a little bit about your background? I know you have a really interesting story about uh, discovering uh, rare cancer in children in New Hampshire. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. that? Yep, so uh, I went to school for science, for a scientific um, degree program. And about 30 years ago, I started working in the environmental science field as an environmental consultant. And I started my own business about 20 years ago and did a lot of investigation on environmental issues. And about in 2014 or 12, um, 13, I mean, uh, there, my son who goes to school, was going to school at an elementary school at the time, that came home and said that his friends at school were talking about these kids that all seemed to be having these really rare cancers. And there was a lot of talk about it. And friends of mine also brought it to my attention and they said, you know, do you think there's an environmental issue here that we should all be concerned about? And uh, I, thought, I thought about it for a little while and I realized at the time that it was probably some kind of an issue because um, you don't really expect to see the same kinds of rare cancers in such a small population in, in many children. So I reported it to the state in 2014 to the cancer registry and asked them to check into it. And it took them about two years to come back with a positive uh, result saying that, yes, there is a cancer cluster. And it actually was five towns of the seacoast of New Hampshire. And that um, prompted some public um, outcry when public meetings were held. And then uh, Governor Hassan at the time set up a task force to investigate environmental triggers for the cancers. And they asked me to be on that um, commission, that task force, because of my background in environmental science. So I served on the task force. And around the same time, uh, one of the, the current representative asked me to run to replace him uh, because he was going to run for Senate. And that was I, I thought he was nuts because I was a mom and an environmental scientist uh, for a long time and had never thought about running for office ever. And he said, no, we really need scientists. And I took a little while to think of it, think about it. And then after talking to some people in my community, I realized that actually there was a place for a scientist to run for, for an office. So I ran and I was actually the top vote getter in a heavily sort of Republican district. And I think it's largely because of the work I did on this task force um, that I was elected. Uh, so I continue to do those kinds of um, things related to the task force. Three bills that I put in in my freshman year passed and were signed by the governor last year, which was big. And they formed three commissions that actually look closely at some of the issues that have come to the surface as a result of the work on my task force. Um, one of them created a, a, a commission for, from the task force. So we have a stable commission now that's continuing to look into these environmental issues relating to the cancers and to push ahead uh, when we have the EPA sending basically one public relations person to our meeting now, uh, instead of scientists coming from the EPA, you know, we are continuing to really try to push these issues forward. And there's a couple of other commissions that had to do with protecting drinking water and also to look for cancer clusters before they come become clusters. So when, um, this summer happened, I put, I was working on my legislation. And then when Carol Shea Porter announced she was retiring, I thought, well, back in 2006, when she ran, she was basically a progressive woman. She was a, uh, um, a social, um, she was a um, social worker. And I thought, why not try it? I, you know, we are being attacked um, on a daily basis as women, as minorities, as, you know, um, all different people are being attacked on a daily basis. And that is something I'm really passionate about fighting against. And the fact that I'm a scientist and there's only one scientist in Congress right now, uh, Bill Prescott from Illinois, I think it is. And he says he's lonely in Congress. So I thought, why not try it? Um, I'm a woman. I'm a progressive. I'm a scientist. And I could bring some really important uh, life experience to the table. And uh, I know um, this past week, I think it was this past weekend, the, the Women's March who were invited to speak. Uh, but then your invitation was rescinded uh, when uh, a male congressional candidate, uh, and just to give people a, a background, the incumbent uh, 
in the New Hampshire's first district isn't running for re-election, so it's a wide open race. Right. Um, so your, your invitation was recent. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what happened um, uh, with the Women's March in New Hampshire? So there were two women's marches that I actually ended up speaking at, um, one in Concord, which is our state capital, and one in the seacoast area, Portsmouth, which is where my community is, where I've lived for 30 years. Uh, so when they asked me to speak, I was really excited. Uh, usually I'd only talk about science. I don't get to talk about these other issues that are really important um, to women. Um, and so I was really excited to be able to speak. And then I was disappointed when they said that there had been too much um, uh, too much controversy around it so that they pulled my my uh, invitation. Um, and then the organizers of the Concord March called me and asked me to come speak. And then they uh, the Portsmouth organizers came back and again at, invited me to speak. So it was a great day. I really enjoyed being able to talk about all these issues that are really important to women uh, and to um, you know many people in my community. So it was, it was a fantastic day. And uh, I know on your, on your campaign website it says you support Medicare for all. Absolutely. Uh, obviously, this is a big battle uh, with yep. the, the Democratic Party. So, uh, you know, can you explain why you support Medicare for all? And, uh, you know, how do you dispel, you know, some of the criticisms from within the Democratic Party that, uh, you know, running on Medicare for all uh, is, you know, a, a political um, you know, it provides, you know, with political baggage, you know, some people say that, uh, some people see it's too radical. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on, you know, by your, uh, running on, uh, this policy? Yeah. So we, Medicare, as we know, is already functioning and it does provide, um, pretty, um, cost effective, um, access to many people, uh, for healthcare. And I think that, you know, we spend a lot of money on healthcare in this country and we're a wealthy country. Most other countries like ours do provide um, medical care to their, um, you know, to the citizens. And I think it's a right for every single person in our country to be able to get high quality, affordable healthcare. Um, we don't want to be throwing people on the streets that happened a few weeks ago in Baltimore where a woman was thrown out in the street because she didn't have health insurance. I mean, I think we're better than that. And I think, you know, providing Medicare for all will also spur innovation. As a small business owner, I know how hard it is to be able to afford health insurance for your workers. And I think, you know, I was able to leave my uh, corporate job because I have a husband who has a really good health insurance plan and he was able to, you know, maintain our insurance for our family. And I think these are concerns that um, most people face when they think about their jobs and we're all feeling sort of cornered in jobs that may, we may or may not like. And I think it would provide um, some uh, flexibility for people to go out and do exactly what they want to do. So I think it's a right of all people. And I think that we can't, you know, I think I'm concerned about the, the national debt that's, you know, it being increased. We know there's a, a trillion dollars in debt uh, added to the national debt with the, the latest budget um, passed. And I am concerned that that is going to give everybody a reason to say we can't afford social security, we can't afford Medicare for all, we can't afford all these programs. And you know, New Hampshire has the second highest rate of overdose deaths in uh, the country. And we have a big issue here and we need to start spending some money on healthcare, we need to put, it, put our priorities in place and um, stop adding, stop giving corporations the, the tax benefits that we should get as, as citizens. There you are. I got. I had a little bit of a. Yeah, it cut out for for a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just to to go back to uh, your background uh, in science, um, you know, uh, what do you think? Um, you know, obviously the Trump administration, they're uh, you know what they're doing at the EPA, they're uh, enabling climate change deniers. I mean, what would you like to be able to do uh, in Congress to combat? Uh, the administration's anti-science uh, agenda, as well as improve, um, you know, things like the EPA or U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, or providing states uh, with, um, you know, county or you know, better state 
uh, environmental agencies that provide, um, you know, uh, a, a check and balance to, um, you know, a presidential administration like Trump's that uh, is really uh, working on behalf of fossil fuel uh, industries and polluters. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is a big concern. We know that around 700 people last I saw have left the EPA. And so what that means is that they're probably going to fill in those positions with people that you and I probably don't want in EPA. Um, you know, from Pruitt down, it's probably going to be his friends or, or people that are likewise his, you know, his colleagues. Um, and so this is a big concern. So I think the first step would be we have to fill those positions back in with real scientists who believe in evidence, who want to protect our most vulnerable. I got the three words in of the seven today so far uh, that we're not supposed to talk about. Um, and I think that, you know, these are all really concerning issues. I mean, we just heard this past week about how Trump wants to open up all these areas for um, offshore drilling, which is a huge problem. Um, you know, more reliance on fossil fuels is not going to get us ahead of the game. Um, and we saw nine people leave in protest from the Parks Administration um, last week, so the National Parks um, Bureau. You know, these are all really concerning things. They cleansed all the climate change. Uh, data off of the website. So it's going to take a while. It's going to take some some work to really turn these things around. A lot of damage is being done. And we really need to focus on these things because it, it's in essence, you know, we are threatening public health. EPA is there to protect our water. They're there to protect our environment. And when you route these industries out like the, these um, regulatory agencies out like this, we cause a real public health threat. Um, you know, I would look at ways to, um, a lot of the stuff I do, a lot of the work I do in legislation right now is around um, water, protecting water. And, um, you know, I think we need to revamp how we approve chemicals for use in the market. Right now in Europe, uh, basically a chemical is guilty until proven innocent. In the U.S., it's the opposite way. Chemicals are innocent until they're proven guilty. So we need to sort of turn the tables on that and make the chemical companies prove to us that those are safe before we introduce them to bodies and the environment. And, and um, you know, in New Hampshire, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about the, the trends in, in water quality? Um, um, you know, I, I'm interested in it. I interned at our, I live in Florida, but I interned at our county environmental protection department and water resources. Uh, and here we have an aquifer where that is, you know, tr the water, um, the quantity is, you know, gradually decreasing. The quality is decreasing as well. We have a lot of issues. So, uh, can, can you speak to, you know, some of the issues that people might not be aware of about where water quality is going? Yeah. So, uh, one of the big issues in my community has been these perfluorinated chemicals. There are toxins in our um, environment now that were released as a result of their Teflon-like components. They're in these AFFF foams that they use to fight fires on uh, bases, usually airports and, and, and the like, and fire stations. And that Teflon component, um, that Teflon chemical, when it's introduced into the environment, is very difficult to get out of the environment. And when it gets in your body, it does what's called bioaccumulate. So it, it, over time, it just keeps accumulating. And there's a certain half-life associated with it in your body. and um, a long half-life, some of them up to seven years before they're even halved. And in my community, <clears throat> which has a, an Air Force base that had a release of these AFFF foams, it contaminated the biggest water supply well in this community that had to get shut down. So the city of the city of Portsmouth, which is the city that that lies in, is about um, it took away quite a bit of the buffer, the emergency buffer in the system. So. Um, there's also a Superfund site, which is an old landfill, which has contaminated the water and is threatening water supplies in five different towns around the, the landfill with the same perfluorinated chemicals. So it is a big issue. The seacoast of New Hampshire is a beautiful place. Lots of people want to live here. Lots of tourists come here. We really have to protect our water um, resources and our water supplies. And right now that's being threatened. So a lot of my legislative work in the state of New Hampshire is around protecting that water. One of my commissions is focusing specifically on water supply and protection um, in the seacoast. And we know, you know, having talked to some of the staffers on our federal delegation that 
there's probably 625 bases now across the U.S. that have the same problem suspected uh, going on. So this is a national issue, and that's why I talk about we need to change how we approve chemicals for use in the market because these chemicals snuck through a loophole uh, in, the in the approval process. So we need to really look at how to um, approve these chemicals for use, and it's a nationwide issue now. I'm sure you probably heard of um, some controversy in New Jersey and Bucks County, Pennsylvania. In Michigan, there's a few places where this is a huge issue that we know about now. Um, so these are really important issues. And we heard about, you know, when you talk about um, sea level rise, look what happened in Puerto Rico from this hurricane. When the hurricane came in, they had to start, start serving toxic water from a Superfund site to the people because they had no water. You know, so we really have to be mindful of what we do to our environment and make sure we protect our resources. We can't do anything if we don't have clean water. So it's, this is a really important issue nationwide, not just in my community, but also nationwide. And it's really one of the principal reasons I decided to run for this very reason. It, it needs, we need scientists to work on policy that makes sense. And as far as climate change is concerned, how would you um, engage, you know, obviously the Republican party is really well known for denying climate change and maybe a small handful of uh, Republican elected officials who will even agree that it's uh, an actual thing. Uh, so how do you advise that uh, Democrats and scientists break through that partisan gridlock to start getting Republicans on board in science uh, and uh, you know pushing Democrats and advising them on what ways to uh, really mitigate the effects of climate change and, um, and the causes of it? Yeah. Well, first off, I agree with Tulsi Gabbard's um, approach to, to convert to clean energy, 100% clean energy by 2035. And I think, you know, that's what we need to do. We need to start moving from fossil fuels to um, more sustainable, um, you know, ways of generating um, energy. And so, I, you know, there are some proposals that have been put forth to turn over some of these big uh, manufacturing facilities to uh, manufacture you know, blades for windmills and things like that. Um, with regard to the political situation, so I, you know, one of the things about the work that I do in the State House here in New Hampshire is that these issues, I, I try to find a way to work across the aisle, and I do that a lot. Um, and it, it comes through educating people. You have to get to them and figure out where their head is and figure out how to talk to them. But I think one of the things that I've learned in the past, um, you know, in this, in the last session and this session is, you, you find out what the people are about and you really talk to them at, in, in what they think is important and you convince them and educate them about what you're, what you're trying to, your goal. And that's been a very effective approach that I've used. Um, that's why I got the three bills passed in my freshman year because I had some of the top level Republicans in the party on the bills. Um, and, and it was really, and all the, one of my bills got sort of retained in finance and it just passed through last week or so. But that situation really um, enabled a, a state house wide conversation about water and about chemicals. And now everybody knows about these issues. Um, so, I, and I work across the aisle, depending on the issue. Um, last week we had an abortion registry bill come, actually it was two weeks ago through our state house. And I uh, got that killed by going to conservative members of the other side of the party, of the, of the Republican party, and talking to them about privacy issues and talking about spending $162,000 when we have an opioid crisis in our state. And did that make sense? And those two people were the biggest supporters of my getting that bill killed. So you have to know what to talk to these people about. If you talk to libertarians, you know that maybe they care about um, big government or how they spend money um, and privacy issues and things like that. So you use I think there's a way always to get to somebody to talk to them uh, about what you think is important. You just have to do it the right way and work together with them. And, uh, you know, New Hampshire, uh, you know, it, it appears to be trending blue, uh, but, it, you know, it's obviously a, a swing state. So how would you how do you think the, the Democratic Party, um, sh what sh should they be doing um, going into these 2008 midterms uh, to really um, you know, recoup their losses, uh, not only in New Hampshire, but across the country uh, and really uh, engage with voters that 
uh, you know, they've either ignored or who have been swing voters that have trended toward the Republican Party? How, how do you win them back? Well, I think it's important to speak with those people, but not just to speak at them, but listen to what they want, what's important to them. And I think that that is probably the principal reason why many people were disenfranchised. They didn't feel like their voices were being heard. And so I wanna be the force that listens to the people and works for the people, not the corporations. Um, but I, I want to do things like promote 50, minimum of $15 minimum wage. I think that's too low in some cases. Um, Medicare for all. I wanna listen to what the people want and promote those causes for them. And that's what I do with my legislation now, I think. And um, that's what I wanna do in Washington. I think that would bring the party back together if we really listen to what the people want and fight for that. And, and you know, before we go, is there anything else you would like people to know uh, about your campaign and some of the issues that you're running on? Yeah, so basically because of the way that I've structured my campaign, I'm not gonna be taking money from uh, DC lobbyists and, and PACs and things like that that wanna change my opinion on things. I'm very steadfast in the things that I believe in I want to, um, you know, so I'm not going to be uh, running with big gobs of money in my in my back pocket, <laughs> in my back pocket. So, um, and I think that when I first ran, I knew there was an issue with money in politics. But when I started, when I really got my foot into this race, I realized how big an issue it really is. And I think that that is really the crux of where a lot of our problems come from. And I think that you know, an important thing is to really try to get money out of politics to um, remove that influence on decision-making and really listen to the people. So that's, that's exactly what my goal is. All right, well, Mindy, uh, I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon and, and speak to us about your campaign. Uh, for those of you watching, I'll post the link to her campaign website. Uh, if you wanna learn more about her, follow her on social media or send her a uh, donation. Uh, you know, it was a pleasure, Mindy. I hope to have you on, um, you know, again sometime before the primary. Uh, but, you know, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Mindy. And uh, have a nice weekend, everyone. You too.